Welcome to Exagility. I'm your host, John Coleman. Klaus Leopold, welcome to the Exagility podcast. Hello. Hi, John. Thanks for having me. Klaus, I'm really curious about your history. You've been involved with the Flight Levels Academy for the last couple of years, I believe, and Flight Levels before that as an idea. Before that, you were in the Kanban world, quite well known, and still are very well known in the Kanban world. But I'd love to know more about the pre-Kanban, pre-Flight Levels, Klaus. How did you even get to the start line of all of this Hmm. stuff? The question is where to begin, when I was three, no, maybe a little bit later. I used to work at the university. I was doing research there and I wrote my PhD thesis. And it was basically like this, that I developed everything and then we had to beautify it. I did some, how to say, like master thesis and and, and, and so, so I guided people through master thesis. And at a certain point in time, we were 30 to 40 people who were somehow working on similar things. And I was like, okay, that's no longer so easy. So we we somehow need to somehow, I don't know, find a way of doing it. And I, I heard about project management and stuff like this. And I tried it and I was like, no, this doesn't work. Research, this is probably not the, the best domain for project management. And then I somehow slipped into this uh, agile way of working with it, stand-up meetings, with it, these kind of things. And then it was like, oh yeah, now it's going. So this was more or less my first contact with this agile world. And after the uh, PhD, after my university career, I joined a startup company and I skip over some episodes there, getting back to where Kanban actually came into place. Later on, I, I, well, my official title was CTO and it was, again, we had a lot of people working together who were a small company, but still we had around 30 developers and most of them or parts of them were in Siberia. And I was like, okay, this actual way of working, like this Scrum way of working, it's quite hard. So I somehow stumbled across the work of David Anderson. And I read some blog posts, Carlos Scotland back in the day, I read some blog posts from him. And I was like, mm, this could work. So I tried it and it was really like, it was magic for me because the performance went through the roof and people were like, it's quite relaxed to work here. And I was like, oh, wow, there is something going on. That's where I took a a closer look at, okay, what am I doing here actually? And I tried to understand the systemic behavior behind what's going on. Then I somehow slipped to what I'm doing right now. I'm a consultant. I never ever wanted to be a consultant. I always want to do real work, but yeah, I really enjoy this now. So basically that brought me into this Kanban domain, if this makes sense. It does, Klaus. And I believe you were one of the busiest Kanban trainers in the world for a while. It felt like that. Uh, It felt like you were doing lots of training (laughs) sessions all over the world. Is that right? Yeah. In the beginning, it was interesting. At first, nobody knew what Kanban is, so we really had to build it up, actually. Uh, That's also the reason why I was writing uh, two books about Kanban. And yeah, after the first book, the English name is Kanban Change Leadership. It somehow caught attention. And yes, it was quite busy. Back in in these days, we were traveling, and it was really like traveling over the planet and doing Kanban training, which I really enjoyed. (laughs) So you were uh, having fun doing Kanban, doing lots of training. You probably were asked to go into some clients as well, because I noticed in one of your more recent books, you get asked to come in sometimes at the start, sometimes maybe later on, sometimes to rescue people (laughs) uh, (laughs) out of the situation. And uh, you spotted some problems, I think, which kind of gave rise to the kind of work you're doing at the moment. So this flight levels idea, when was that really incarnated, would you say, roughly? Mm. It's roughly 10 years ago. 
2011 or something like this. And it was a customer. I'm still trying to do way more like uh, working with customers than doing uh, training stuff because you can only do good training if you really know what's going on <laughs> in, in the real life. So, and yeah, back in the day, it was a customer and he was like, okay, yes, we like this agile kind of thing. Uh, we like camp and we like everything what you do. Here are 340-ish teams, make them agile, do camp and with them. I'm like, Sounds like a good job. So <laughs> I was basically already choosing the color of my new Porsche. But then I was like, wait a minute. So yes, we, we, we can make all these teams agile now, but I guarantee you, you won't have an agile organization then. You will have a bunch of agile teams and that's basically it. So I, I somehow tried to come up with pictures. Hey, we need to fly a little bit higher. We need to zoom out from the team level. A team is only doing one part. Most of the time we need multiple teams to like deliver value to the customer. So we need to fly a little bit higher. And this is actually where the first flight level was born. Where we were talking about, okay, there are two flight levels. Yeah, there's the team, but there's even more. And yeah, and then it expanded on, on this idea of flight levels, which I think is a kind of nice way of, of, of explaining it. Yeah, it's a lovely way. And uh, more recently, the Flight Levels Academy was started. Can you tell me a little bit about that and who might be involved in that? Yeah, the Flight Levels Academy. Um, so I, I stopped doing uh, campaign. And I was totally focused on, on flight levels and how to bring this business agility into organizations. And then I wrote the blue book, Rethinking Agile. And that's a good book. <laughs> and in this book, I basically tried to explain a story of an organization and the problems they had in, in becoming agile. And when this book was out, Many people were asking for flight level training and so on. And I was like, okay, I cannot deal with this high demand of requests. So that's when we decided, okay, let's do something about it. And let's found the, the Flight Levels Academy. We is my wife and business partner, Katrine. And we also found Cliff Hazel. I know him from Camp and Days 10 years ago or so when I was working in South Africa. He's originally from South Africa, but then he moved to Sweden to Spotify and he left Spotify. And then there was this opportunity with Flight Was Academy. And then, yeah, we founded it. And the idea is that we somehow try to build the body of knowledge around flight levels and also do like quality assurance and do training workshops around this topic. Indeed. And I, I thought the book was hilarious. It's very well illustrated. Um, you mentioned at the start of the book that you were looking for uh, an illustrator to suit your style. And it took quite a while. And it looked like it was worth the wait. Your humor comes across and your sarcasm as well. Your personality comes true. So at the start of the book, you put the scene together. You've say 600 employees. They all need to be converted so to speak when somebody sets up a transformation project because it's going to wave a magic wand everything's going to be great and the teams will be cross-functional it'll be fantastic all learning from each other and you'll have product teams marty kagan would be proud of you fantastic and uh, you'd put out uh, kanban systems and uh, kanban boards and retrospectives and daily stand-ups and you get in the external coaches and you get everybody trained and not very good results. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and you even said as well, teams can pick their own approach. And a lot of people are doing that. We don't want to be imposing what we want to invite. So all these wonderful things, but it still doesn't work. And that's why you started this flight level thing really close, wasn't it? Because exactly. you spotted this. And you have a bit of a dig at the other frameworks, I think. Uh, it's all in jest, I'm sure. And I think, but I can see where you're going with this. How do you build the story? Like, how do you explain to executives that flight levels is even needed? Because it sounds like people are doing a wonderful job already, except for maybe the outcomes aren't going to come on the other side. I draw a picture in the book about the keyboard and I like this picture. Yeah. So what we often try to do, we, we, we take the organization apart into just single parts, like the teams, and then we want to optimize the teams, high performing teams. That's something what we hear so often. 
However, the reality is that most of the time, one team alone cannot deliver directly to the market. So we need to coordinate the, the team so that the right team is working on the right stuff at the right time. And the same is true when you are typing on a keyboard. If you make sure that you hit each and every key totally fast, this does not mean that your letter is finished much faster. So when you operate on a keyboard, it's more important that you press the right key at the right time. And the same is true for organizations. It's not important that we have high-performing teams. It's great if we have high-performing teams, but still, if you're missing to make sure that the right team is working on the right stuff at the right time, yeah, you probably won't see the results that you want uh, to see. And this is something that you cannot uh, yeah, solve on the team level. You need to zoom out, and that's what we would call flight level two. So flight level one would be the operational level, the team level. And the flight level two is coordination level. And the good thing with flight level two is it actually doesn't matter how teams are working on a flight level one. Teams can do scrum, they can do campaign, or they can just work. That's also fine. Mm -hmm. Flight level two, it's really making sure that the right team is working on the right stuff at the right time. And the cool thing with this is it totally fits into an organization where there's already agility or something like this going on. And that's also what we see in, in many, especially very large organizations. Usually it's not, if, if you have an organization with, uh, let's say, 100,000 people, it's not 100,000 people doing Scrum. You have some Scrum islands over there, you have camping islands over there, maybe a safe train is somewhere passing by. So you have these multiple things that are going on and organizations are using flight levels to somehow glue these agile islands together and align the work to the strategy. So that's what we see in reality, what's going on with flight levels. Yeah, I can relate to that, Klaus, because one of the clients that I'm working with at the moment, what's becoming apparent about a year and a half in, is that, yeah, you would have predicted and I would have predicted as well a few months ago, or even at the very start, that uh, teams can only go so well. Normally, we're part of some bigger system. There's other people that we cooperate with, we collaborate with, and we can have the most agile team in the world with the most beautiful Kanban board or scrum board in the world. But if we're depending on other people, and if they have different priorities, those other people, we could have work that's waiting on our board for quite some time. Yeah. And so one of the things I like to work, the teams I work with, I like to uh, talk about work items, an item that uh, delivers value, essentially. Uh, the Scrum people might call them product backlog items or stories yeah. or whatever, but I don't really mind what you call it as long as it's delivering value. So the item would be a piece of work and it might have some subtasks on it. And Mary might be involved. Maybe she's working with Klaus and John and there's a little subtask with their name on it. And they might even block the item if it's stuck. But one of the pieces of progress I've made is that when you have a board in a team, it's good to visualize who we're depending on without necessarily having a dependency board that you could literally in your in progress column have different swim lanes for the different functions that, you know, this bobbing around has gone to R&D, now it's gone to supply chain, and you can see where the heat is, and you can see where the work is getting stuck. But a lot of teams make the mistake of they put the work items on the board, they, they, they think they're doing the work themselves, and then we all know the work is going into a black hole, but we're not visualizing how long that work is waiting. Is that something that you see as well, Klaus? Yeah, totally. I like what you said that we are somehow trying to make it visible, uh, like where these blockers are. You can do it on the work item, but we also have these waiting queues actually in our flows. And in the end, I'm borrowing this idea from Troy McGinnis, but I really like it. Troy is always like, okay. He says, okay, a dependency is nothing else than a blocker in the future. So we already know that we will run into a blocker here in the future. So let's talk about it now so that we prevent running in it. So you take the conversation like to the now and we discuss about the future, like if we are running in a dependency or if we can uh, somehow go around it. Uh, yeah, I think that's quite important when we are designing our systems that we take care of this. Yeah, it's interesting. You just reminded me of a conversation I had with Steve Tendon a few months ago on one of the YouTube shows, and uh, he was talking about full kitting from his context. So basically, Steve Tendon has tame flow combination of Kanban theory of constraints. I'm oversimplifying now, but the throughput account is in there as well. But essentially what he was saying was if you if when you do full kitting, he was saying there's a few things. First of all, if somebody asked for something six months ago, if they asked for six months ago, maybe we should just double check is did they still want it? What problem did what they're trying to solve? What's the opportunity? But also, are there some ducks we need to line up? Dependencies, as you talk, uh, 
And so it's sad when we see work starting. We already know there's a dependency in the other team. Of course, it's yeah. going to get blocked. We didn't, uh, or did we talk to the people actually? Did we give them a yeah. heads up visibility even that we were coming knocking on their door? Yeah, this is also one, let's say, principles of what we try to do in flight levels land, have a conversation before we start to work, start to work, and then let's have a conversation about the work. So it's really like having this conversation before so that we can uh, avoid a lot of these roadblocks uh, that are somehow ahead of us. A, a team has a board, let's say, and... As you said in one of your earlier books, we don't want it just to be a to-do list for the team. It needs to demonstrate the flow of the work and there might be some various in progress columns to reflect what's going on. And so you've got the work going through and you've got some work you're visualizing in some way to either through some waiting columns or, or through some dedicated boxes on the board that highlight uh, or we're, we're waiting for those people to do something or whatever. But then if you go another level up, Depending on the organization, some organizations are very project oriented. So they have initiatives, objectives, key results, initiatives, breaking down into projects, breaking down into work items. So the next level up, which would be the flight level two board from your parlance would be where you, you might have the projects or the products, if it was a product organization, mm. I guess. And you'd be trying to visualize the coordination there. You'd be trying to stretch the value stream as an it starts here in marketing and sales. It goes on to supply chain and moves on to R and D. Uh, then it goes on to legal, or then it comes back, or well, items yeah. don't go back. But you know what I mean. You can see the flow from the, the the customer request, if you like, right through to delivering the stuff. So, what kind of experience have you had with that, those? Because what what I notice a lot of the time is people like me who get hired into a particular function, and you realize, oh, hang on a second, I need to coordinate like four or five different functions here, and there's a few hundred projects going on on my function. There's probably a few thousand over there. So how are we even going to get people to listen to me? How do we collaborate together? How do you manage that, uh, Klaus? Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. And it's not an easy question. If you take a look at flight levels, it somehow sounds so simple. So we have flight level one. This is the teams that are working operational level, flight level two, coordination, end-to-end, -end, the world of your product services, and so on. And then we have flight level three, the strategy. The problem is that if, if you take these three levels, it looks like, okay, we can just put our org chart on it and we are done. But that's exactly not the point behind flight levels. The idea is that we want to map our operational structure to these three flight levels. And what's, what you was, what were talking about, the flight level two, is actually the most challenging part here. Seeing the poster and uh, mapping it to the org chart is easy, but this doesn't help most of the time. So Finding flight level two systems, proper flight level two systems, is not an easy task. We have an own workshop, which is called the flight level systems architecture, where we try to map more or less this idea of the three flight levels to your organization. And when you're doing it, you figure out that most of the time you have multiple flight level two systems. You have flight level two systems that somehow blend together with strategy, flight level three systems, with operational flight level one systems. And you have a lot of dependencies between these flight level two systems. So what we are doing is we're basically like in the first step, building a work systems topology. That's what we call this is like, okay, what are our flight level one, two, and three systems and how are they connected together? And if we have this picture, it, it's more like having a map of our organization and see the different work systems and how they interact. When we have this picture, then we can start to bring the people on board and build the systems with the people. So usually we don't build the flight level two system for people, we build it with the people. Because as you said, in a flight level two system, there is multiple functions involved. And on the work system topology, you find out which functions, and then you need to onboard them and build the flight level two systems with them. That's at least um, what works most of the time. Yeah, it kind of makes sense. And one of my clients at the moment, probably what I'd have to do is kind of build up the evidence of the metrics in terms of what work is going, where's the pattern, and then that you've got to kind of business case, for want of a better word, to, to knock on the door of the people who we're trying to collaborate with saying, look, yeah. can we work better? And actually, maybe there's some stuff you want us to do as well in your function, and maybe we can help each other out to do these more end-to-end yeah. -end boards. And thankfully, by the way, I'm seeing coaches. I had a call this morning 
with some other coaches in the same organization who are reaching out to me as well about how do we get these connected? How do we collaborate? So we just stretch the view of uh, value going through the organization. And the interesting thing is there's no right, there's no wrong. So especially when it comes to these uh, cross team systems, it depends on what you want to focus on. So the point is, whenever we build the flightable tool systems, we system, we don't do a reorganization. It's more like a virtual organization that we are building. There's a cool flight club episode with Bosch where someone explains, okay, how they build a virtual organization with flight levels. So the idea is all the team set up and everything remains the same, but we bring the people together in front of this board so that they can have their conversation, how to manage work. And the thing is, how do you bring them together? What is the view? Is it a product? Is it a service? If you have something like this, that's easy. You could also build project boards as flight level two, maybe, but you can build customer segment boards. I don't know, market segment boards. You can build strategic initiative boards. So it always uh, depends on what is important in your context. And this is really, flight level two is really the most challenging part in flight levels, I think. Yeah, you kind of hit the nail on the head there. So one of the things we've already talked about is dependencies. And ultimately, we need to work together as a unit. But the other thing, when we talk about flight level one for the operational board for the team, flight level two, kind of coordinating kind of value stream, if you like, where you can see yeah. dependencies, you can see who's waiting on who, you can talk to each other, you can look at the, the floor plan, so to speak, and your lovely drawings in the book are very well illustrated. But then the strategic board is about, this is hitting the nail on the head, and this is probably an uncomfortable message for the audience here, because ultimately... The teams, they can be limiting work in progress all they want. They can be doing Scrum, they can be doing XP. Whatever the teams are doing, they're really just coping strategies for the work that's already in the system. But I think what you're saying in the book is that one of the key reasons why things don't get better, actually, is because we haven't actually tried to somehow match the flow of the organization with the amount of work that's getting started. You talked about stable systems and unstable systems. I wonder if you could elaborate a bit on that, uh, please, Klaus. Yeah, that, that, that's a very good point. So I think it, it's two things in there. One thing is stable system versus unstable system. It doesn't make sense to start more work than we are able to finish. So in the book, I'm drawing the, the picture of an airport. When you're running an airport and you have more planes landing, like coming in and coming out, you are, yeah running into problems quite soon and the same is true if we are operating our work system if you have a work system where more work arrives than departs you're running into a problem that's stable systems versus unstable systems so stable system is like where the arrival rate and departure rate is roughly the same but the other question is what is arriving to our system and what is departing and that's what we see and and i think that's what what, what you already uh, mentioned before, John, what we see quite often is that our teams are trying to create this focus. They're like, okay, we are doing sprints. This means we are trying, when you're doing a sprint, you're basically trying to map the arrival rate with the departure rate. You're like, okay, we take these amount of items in, we ship them within two weeks, and then we take another batch of items in. The same is true for working process limits in, in a company world. So that's exactly what you're doing. But the question is, what are you limiting? If you are on a team level, if you are limiting the, the work items you have access on a team level, are most of the time tasks or stories or something like this, right? So you create focus and probably even build a stable system for tasks and stories, which is not too bad. But if you want to speed up your projects or your initiatives, you won't succeed because the problem is you need to create focus around these topics where you actually want to see the improvement. And that's what we see so often that uh, teams are really trying to keep the focus, campaign teams uh, trying to stay within the whip limits, scrum teams, like with the sprint goals and everything. So they are limiting stories and tasks, but in parallel, they are working on a thousand projects. And none of the projects is being finished faster. Most of the time, it's even like this, that um, senior executive think, okay, now we have agile team, so we can even start more projects. No, wrong. <laughs> so you need to create focus around your initiatives if you want to speed them up, if this makes sense. 
Yeah, it makes a whole lot of sense. And there was a slide, I think it was Ludden Lean Kanban Days. I didn't actually see your talk, but I heard about it afterwards and I pulled it up and showed it to people. And they, they, it's very funny. It was like you'd be, you'd big load of posters, on Kanban boards and scrum boards all linked together, kind of zigzagging all over the place. There's a few similar posters in your book. Mm. And then you had this kind of expression, and I'll be careful with my language, so <laughs> bloody agile in this two week bit where the team was trying to get faster but actually the value stream was months long and that's the yeah. irony isn't it and exactly and even when people play when people learn kanban they might play get kanban or they might play twig or some simulation like that the the key a lot of the time to performance is be careful about what you start because once the stuff exactly. is in there you're just cope you can be brilliant with uh, how you manage your flow as a team but there's so much energy jumping all over the place that actually it's almost easy to just nuke what comes in. And uh, I love the visualization that you had as well, where you showed there was like loads of projects in progress. And I remember doing this in Baku and Azerbaijan a few years ago. There were 46 in progress, you see? Mm. So I came in on a Sunday. I said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to take Close's idea. I'm going to put active and inactive. Yeah, exactly. So I moved everything into inactive. And Monday morning, I said, guys and gals, it's fiddling around the weekend with the board. By the way, that was a big mistake. So I should have done it with them. But anyway, I said, would you mind um, moving your work into, I'm not being cheeky. I, I just didn't want to pretend you're, they were all active if they're not really active. So if there's something that you're really working on right now, can you just stick it into active and everything else? Can you just show it as inactive? And six items move into active. So we had this illusion <laughs> yeah, yeah. of loads of things going on. That's actually a very powerful pattern. So uh, we use this pattern a lot in our flight level flow design workshop. So it's really like separating the board into an active part and an inactive part, just to be aware of, yes, there might be a lot of work in process, but it's not making progress. So that's also why I love like the abbreviation WIP. Uh, for me, it's, it's more work in process than work in progress because most of the time there's a lot of work in process which doesn't make any progress. But distinguishing this really makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, and but you went even further because I think I saw in the book that you're, you, I think you were suggesting, I'm not sure if I totally got it, but it was a, let's say there's a lot of projects in progress, most have been active. And you had this lady and she was getting them all together and she's moving them back to the start and saying, hey, on a second, let's be honest here. They're not really in progress. So let's just focus on these ones. Yeah. Get them done and pull in. Was, was that, a, did I pick that up wrong in the book or? The, that's a bold move if, if you can make it. Most of the time it's difficult. Let me put it that way. But how to approach the situation? I like what you just said. We separate between active work and inactive work. And then we set up policies. For instance, the policy is we don't start new stuff because we want to finish all these uh, things. So we try to create focus around the active parts. And when an active uh, item is shipped, is delivered, we can pull an inactive one into active. So uh, we're somehow trying to deplete the system. We make inactive work active finish it, make it active, finish it, but we don't start new work. And this is how you can deplete uh, the system quite well. So this usually works a little bit better than, okay, let's take everything uh, back to start. That's always what I do in the beginning. Let's put everything uh, back to, to the start, but then usually it doesn't take very long to hear voices. No, we can't do this. We can't do this. We can't do this. Yeah. So there are the world is not black and white. There are 50 shades of green. That's between, right. right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> For example, a lot of the teams I work with, the work items take a few months. I do a lot of work in non-tech and the work items tend to be longer than 30 days. Yeah. Thankfully, a lot of them get down below 30 days. A lot of them could be two months, 85% of the time, it take two months uh, or less. And some of them might get away with four months and so on. So yeah, that's been a kind of a bit of an issue there, but trying to trying to get them down. So the thing is then if you have all of these projects going on and these work items or even initiatives within product groups. So what happens is then I'm depending on this other function. So there's a sense that people feel, well, I need to send it off to them because they've got a lead time of two months or whatever it is. And they're not saying the sooner we start, the sooner we finish, but they just want to get it started. So they can then pick up something else and they're trying to use their dead time and so on. And so it's awkward, isn't it? So it's trying to, we want to stop starting, start finishing, but we also have this situation that if, 
until such time as you connect your value stream, there's work you need to get started as well. It's, it's, it's a really difficult situation. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> totally agree. And if you somehow combine this with idea of high utilization, like resource utilization, yeah, you're basically screwed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So the, a key message for executives is uh, we talk about teams doing work in progress. I love the one-liner you have in your book. And I think I saw somewhere else, business agility is not a team sport, it's a company sport. And I often talk about executive having to fix problems. So when problems get escalated, you don't just push it back down and say you're empowered, you need to help them fix the problems. But that kind of leads us on to meetings, right? Because one of my clients at the moment, I get a lot of grief about how many meetings I'm suggesting people have, and it's ultimately they will decide what meetings they have, but like daily meetings and retrospectives, and they might do some, they might do some refinement, for example, if they want to try and understand the work and break it down a bit and understand the dependencies. I've got a lot of pushback for even uh, looking at what's being delivered. Um, so there's meetings at the operational board level, but I'm guessing, and I think I saw in the book that at the level two, and probably level, I think you definitely saw in level three, yeah there would be meetings at those levels as well. Can you talk a little bit more about that, Klaus? Yeah, sure. The thing is, on the operational level, we know stand-up meetings and all these things, and they serve a, a purpose. There's a reason why we are doing it, right? And if you're collaborating across the value stream, a stand-up meeting, for instance, is also quite important. But the problem is, whenever we are working on a Flight Level 2 system, we usually run into large group facilitations. Because Flight Level 2 systems sometimes are like 200 people or something like this. So 200 people are working on one flight level two system. So doing daily stand-up meetings with all members is probably not very cost effective. We find different ways of, of doing it. On a flight level two, we often work with delegates. So each team, let's say uh, we have, I don't know, 200 people. Let's say this is 20 teams or something like this. Each team sends a delegate to a stand-up meeting, the delegates, they have a stand-up meeting, having a conversation about the dependencies, what to start next, and so on. And then the delegates go back to the team and have a stand-up meeting there. And this is how we make sure that we are somehow coordinating across all the teams. But still, you even here, you run into large groups. Like a, a stand-up meeting with 20 people or 30 people works differently than a stand-up meeting in my team with my six colleagues. So you have to be really like more effective. You have to talk more about the work that's actually going on. Because just imagine if you, if you ask the three uh, scrum questions, like what have you done yesterday, your team? What has your team done or, or will do today? And how are you? I don't know what the questions are. You need to be way more effective in running these meetings. But... The good news is there are like tips and tricks how to do it. So yeah. it's, not a, it's not a miracle. One of the things I do with my current client, uh, just even daily meetings at an operational level, I asked people to, as you said, the, the three questions in Scrum that were guidance, but people took them as a prescription that they're gone now, thankfully. But it can be useful in a small team, but when you got lots of people, very difficult. When you got people as well who aren't really a team, where it's like a group of people and they're working individually and they're not really a, a unit, what I found is a formula is where basically the first item in the agenda is what do we need to collaborate on today? It's the first thing. And then nice. maybe if there's nine people there, maybe four people talk, job done. Maybe nobody talks. Maybe everybody yeah. talks. If it goes on for five minutes, it goes on to two minutes. And then the next thing I do is uh, I say, okay, let's look at the Kanban board and let's look at the ones that are breaking their service level expectation, the, you know, the little progress bar and the card. If it's a digital yeah. tool and Okay, for that type of work, it looks like it's going into the red. We need to do something about that, or that item is blocked over there, and, and then that's it. We don't look at all the cards, just look at what yeah. uh, might be getting into trouble. Have you come up with little kind of heuristics like that as well, When you, particularly when you get to the flight level two, flight level three, like mm. in terms of trying to make those sessions a bit more effective? Yeah, easy things are, like for instance, we just point on the items on the wall, 
on the system. Yeah. And if there's something that we need to talk about, let's talk about. And even it doesn't make sense to run through all the items all the time, especially okay. when you are on a large system. In a physical board, you basically, or for instance, flip the work item to 90 degrees or something like this, and everyone can rotate the sticky notes. And in virtual times, you add a tag or something like this. And this means we only talk about the tagged items because the rest is just flowing. And yeah, with easy tips like this or focus on the block first then on the rotated or on the flag ones and then let's take a look what we want to start you can do quite a lot in quite a short amount of time i'm curious then i think i saw you mentioning retrospectives at a flight level too i think you mentioned as well reviewing the strategic board probably weekly the retrospectives must be coming up with kind of some juicy stuff because in some organizations when they they start this journey towards business agility the journey that a lot of the leaders need to go on as well as being okay with bad news and finding out that things aren't going as well as we thought they were supposed to be going and all that. And the retrospective is this kind of, okay, we can use fancy techniques like a prime directive where we don't finger point mm. and all that, but ultimately we're in danger of pressing some hot buttons or, and, and, and that ha can happen more and more the more senior you go. What, what coping strategies have you tried to deal with those situations, Klaus, or have you found some other way to get around it? Yeah. My way to get around it is to call in Siggy, my colleague. Actually, I've written Camp and Change Leadership, the book with him. And yeah, we're working together for more than 10 years. And he's the one who's really good in these situations. So yeah. I'm more like the technical guy. <laughs> and I know how the systems work. And when it comes to these uh, things, I have some strategies and everything. But when it's yeah. really getting tricky, it's I think it's to a certain extent a, a different discipline. Yeah. And he's just fabulous in this. <laughs> that sounds really good and know what you can do <laughs> yeah that's true actually I play to each other's strengths as well indeed yeah, yeah. this sounds really good uh Klaus. so in terms of how many people are using this and all that i don't need to know the numbers exactly but i've seen you've had some case studies i noticed bosch for example i think i noticed at least two other case studies on the website and you even had some flight club shows where people came on from those companies and talked about how they were doing it and so on. But what's the momentum like in the flight levels community at the moment? How are things going from a growth point of view? For me, to a certain extent, it's somehow crazy because I see more and more organizations doing flight levels. And it's really like often like by coincidence, I know that there is someone talking about a case study a couple of months ago. In Brazil, a company with 20,000 people, we are doing flight. I was like, oh, wow, good to know. It, it's crazy. So there's really uh, quite a lot of momentum. And honestly, I don't know how many are doing it. I know of many, but I think there's way more where we actually don't know it. And the cool thing is more and more organizations doing flight levels in addition to what they are doing already. So we're going to have the first German flight level stay in uh, November. We will do an international one in 2022. November 2021, we're having the first flight level stay. And there is Fernandez talking at this flight level stay. And he's reporting about their case at Swisscom. They had the executive uh, decision like four years ago or so to do SAFE. But they also do flight levels to somehow implement SAFE and improve SAFE. That's something what's really popping up more and more often, that flight levels is not like uh, fire and water compared to what you're currently doing. Like it's not about yeah, flight levels or SAFE or something like this. It's more like steak and potato. They go very well together. And uh, yeah, there is uh, a lot of organizations who are just combining it and they are somehow gluing their agile islands together with flight levels. And I think that's really fantastic because I'm a huge fan of inclusion and not excluding the stuff. And especially if flight levels is being used to include or is included in, in what's already there, I'm totally happy with this. Yeah, I can see a lot of merit in that now is because uh, some organizations need prescription. So it makes me very uncomfortable when I see that sometimes. One of my clients is that at the moment where if I don't say exactly what you should be doing in a daily, if I don't mm. give some guidance in terms and what exactly what's the minimum, minimum you need to be doing in retrospective, they can add to it. If I just provide guidance and I don't provide and do it like this. They, they could go into chaos, but there's other clients then where you give them some guidance and they're off. So I, I do like the idea there. And I did pick that up, but I was even thinking this morning, I was thinking of flight less, ah. <laughs> uh, less one of my clients, because I could see how we could 
pull from the strengths of both of them to, to the learning from less, for example, and the glue, as you say, from flight levels and the, I guess, the humility of flight levels as well, and that it's really open, very simple. And I think it's a compliment to you and your group as well, that people are doing flight levels and you, you, you weren't even aware they were doing it. They just, they probably read the book or something and they just got going, which is fantastic, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, it's Perfect. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thank you so much for coming on the show and explaining to executives and C-suites and the board members and so on about the flight levels. Thank you so much for coming on. I wish you the best of luck in the future. Hopefully we'll talk again soon. Cool. Thanks for having me, John. Thank you. Goodbye.